welcome. I know, I know it's almost time for drinks, but bear with me just for a little while. I want to share my story on how, was I, how I was able to make impact, actually more than I could have ever imagined myself. And there might be just some lessons in there for you that might help you on your path. Last year, I'm sitting in the back of this Toyota Land Cruiser. You know, it's this big 4x4, big green 4x4. And I'm there with my team. I'm sitting in the back sideways with my knees raised up high. It's not very comfortable at all. I'm there with my team and all the gear that we need, all the special stuff. And as we leave the populated areas, the roads become worse and worse. There are these big potholes in the road. We hit one of those potholes, we fly through the car, I bump my head, and our gear flies through the car, and I just hope everything will stay in one piece, because it's quite sensitive. We continue our journey. The sun sets, and the sky turns from blue to black, when suddenly the driver slams on the brakes, and we see a group of elephants come out of the forest, and they cross the road in front of us. They look up, they notice us, mind their own business, and then disappear into the forest again. And then finally, man, finally we arrive at our destination, and I'm just happy to be there. It's pitch black outside, I can't see where, I'm at, where, where I am, but you know, I'm glad my organs are still in one place, and that I can get out of that dreaded truck after 14 long hours. I wake up in the middle of the African rainforest. I wake up in this research center. It's a small research center on top of a grassy hill, and it consists just of a few wooden buildings. And as far as the eye can see, there's nature. Nature untouched by humans. This is in Gabon, in Lope National Park. And Gabon is a small country in Central Africa. Um, it's, it's about the size of the UK. For African standards, it's a small country. And it's very important for the animals that we saw before, the forest elephants. In fact, Gabon is the last safe haven for forest elephants, and it houses 70% of the global population of elephants. Now, I don't think it will come as a surprise to you if I say that these elephants are in danger. Where there used to be millions, there are now only less than 100,000 left. And there are a couple of reasons for this. For this. One you probably know, it's called poaching. It's where the elephants get killed for the ivory in their tusks. But there is another big threat to these elephants. Something you probably won't know exists, and we actually witnessed this when we were visiting a small village in Gabon. I don't hear any sound, by the way, so I'm going to go back. Is the sound on? It's... So elephants had broken into their plantation that they need for food to survive and to provide for their families. And these are, uh, these are uh, big, big, big uh, challenges for the local people and for the elephants. Why does this happen? This happens because the trees in the forest there are producing less fruit every year. So what you get is hungry elephants, or should I say hangry elephants. Because you can, look it, uh, you can see it looking at the pictures of these elephants. They, they look very skinny. You can see their ribs and their hips sticking through their thick skin. 
So these, these elephants, and I have two teenage daughters, and I know what it can do with their mood if I, they don't get fed for like three hours. So I can only imagine what these uh, elephants look li uh, feel like. So these elephants, they go look for sources of food elsewhere, and in the process, break into plantations, through fences, you know, just to still their hunger. And these are deadly conflicts. When elephants are looking for food and they encounter humans, they might charge and kill them. In retaliation, the local farmers sometimes plant traps. I've seen pictures of these wooden boars with this long nails uh, uh, in them, and they spread it out in the plantation, hoping that the elephant will step on it, or they will throw spears at the, at the elephant, sometimes lethally wounding them. So for, for, the, for, the, for the people there and for the elephants, this is not a good thing at all. Now, by now you might think, who is this guy? Uh, this is a developer conference, right? Well, don't worry, I spent the last 20 years of my career behind the keyboard, maybe like most of you. And um, uh, what I noticed uh, at some point is that, um, in fact, by the way, I didn't even know Gabon was a country until I started working on this project. But uh, what, I, what I at some point in time had is that I got this uneasy feeling doing my, my work. You know, I loved you know, technology and loved coding, but something wasn't right. And by then, I had probably already written about a million lines of code. And I began to wonder, with how many of these lines of code did I actually do some good in the world? And my own conclusion was, probably not that many. This was not a very good state I was in. And I thought, okay, this, this completely changed my perspective. I now wanted to see how can I get the most out of my lines of code. And it started small. I started looking at maybe I can build this feature with less lines of code and have it still do the same thing. Or maybe we shouldn't build a feature at all because, you know, the best code is no code. But soon I started to think, what if I could, my, could put my lines of code to use on the bigger challenges in this world? And I set out to do that, but I knew I had to get away from behind my keyboard to, to, to get there. So I started reaching out to people. I, st I started talking to people that were working at problems that I wanted to solve. And the more I talked to people, especially people that were outside of my IT bubble, for instance, rangers that are protecting these animals in wildlife reserves, the more I realized that I had a unique perspective on these problems and that, that I could actually help having a nerd's eye view. More and more I came to believe that I could make a difference in these topics, but I just had to get out there and do it. But for me this was easier said than done. Um, I don't know about you, but many times I ask myself the question, who am I to work on this topic? Or somebody else, somebody smarter than me must already be fixing this. Or I don't have the skills yet to work on these big challenges. So for me, part of the process was, you know, not letting my, myself be held back by these thoughts and overcoming my self-doubt and just go for it. But still, still today, until the day of today, I uh, actually today, I still uh, feel like I don't know what I'm doing most of the time, and uh, like I'm way out of my depth. I think maybe you recognize this feeling that you don't know what you're doing, but you're still doing it anyway. Where it used to stop me, I now think that it's actually good. It's a good thing because. Even though it doesn't, it, it feels uncomfortable. And I think there's a hint there. Because when it feels uncomfortable, it means you're working outside of your comfort zone. And that is where the magic happens. That is where you learn and that's where you really push the boundaries of what you can do. So now I'm looking through the lens of technologies at these big topics. It can be, for instance, wildlife conservation, but also social problems, and human, humanitarian problems. I work at Q42, and Q42 is a software agency. Um, we build websites, apps, we have built a PostNL app, you, na you name it. 
And what I like about Q42 is not, so, uh, not uh, especially the, the cool clients that we work with or the cool projects that we use or the technology that we use, but that we get the freedom to really explore what it is that we want to do. And this is for, every, for everybody, this is different. So there, I have colleagues that started their own startup. Um, but for me, this was trying to you know, uh, tackle these big challenges. And together with my colleague Tim, I'm running Hack the Planet. Now, Hack the Planet is a small department within Q42 where we focus on making impact and not profit. Actually, we are really good at not making profit because uh, Q42 invests 15 to 200 percent of the annual revenue into the projects that we do at Hack the Planet. I will give you a couple of examples of the projects that we do at Hack the Planet. And um, then I will take you back into the African rainforest. One of the projects that we worked on was um, a VR application for elderly people. A lot of the elderly people in the Netherlands, and they call it vergrijzing, I'm, I'm chipping in here, um, but they're very lonely. And uh, we, were, uh, we were doing this hackathon and we, were, we, were in, uh, we, we, um, we saw this problem and we thought, well, how can we help? And we thought, if we make a VR experience, that how can we make a VR experience that can connect these people? So that's what we did. We, we, uh, we made a VR experience that they can use in elderly care homes uh, in the recreation room. So for instance, there are a couple of uh, these, uh, these people, they are sitting around and two or three of them can put on a headset and then the, the, the social worker can turn on one of the experiences. And it, for instance, it's like a boat trip in Venice or just going to the beach. And then when the goggles come off, it sparks conversation. Suddenly people are talking to each other and it brings up childhood memories. I've even heard stories of a woman, of, of a woman that uh, was suffering from severe dementia and hadn't spoken a word for a year. And after she wit saw one of our videos, she suddenly, suddenly became t talking again. So that's really cool. Another project we actually recently uh, launched. And this, pro this project is called What the Fuck. And it's about 100,000 people. 100,000 people every year that become victim of online sexual harassment. And these are very young people, children, maybe even our own children, maybe without even us knowing it, as, our, as, as their parents. I've, I have heard their stories t way too many times, developing this platform. And they all start with, I was 12 or 13 years old. I met this guy on Snapchat. I sent him my pictures, and you can guess what kind of pictures. And then it spirals down from there. It was really heartbreaking to hear what it does to these kids and to their mental health. Uh, a lot of them become suicidal. Um, so yeah, it was not really, um, uh, these are not stories you want to hear, especially not, you know, like I said, I have two teenage daughters, so it can happen to them as well. But the problem is that of these 100,000 people, a very few find a way to help. And, um, our challenge was, how do we reach these people? And our solution was, we wanted to make something together with them. So, um, uh, to speak in their own language. So we pitched three concepts and we, we asked them, what would help you find, um, find help if you would suffer from uh, online sexual harassment? And they said to us, just share the stories of those victims and we will draw our own conclusions. And that's exactly what, what we built. We built an online, interactive artwork that expresses the emotions of five victims that share their own story. One of the victims, uh, Rose, she talks about being caught in a web of lies and deceit. So we have all these kind of spiders in there that move around. And they, these victims tell their, tell their story and at some point we offer also help. And these victims also tell how they broke out of the cycle. Um, we also have a feature where um, the visitors can leave their own story. In, a, in the last uh, four months, 
100,000 people visited our online interactive. And um, almost 200 people have shared their own story. And I, I was really proud to hear because, especially if you remember that for these people, it's really hard to write about these things. And it's a very important step to finding help. So just this was in a nutshell some of the project, projects that we do at, uh, at Hector Planet. But what we are most involved with is these wildlife conservation projects uh, that brings us into Africa. Now, for these projects, we talk to these rangers because, you know, I don't know anything about poaching. I, I didn't know human elephant conflicts was a thing. Um, but we talk to these rangers and then they tell us how they do their work and how do they, do they protect these elephants. And they shared with us that they often work with camera traps. This is a camera trap. Just a small device, you can buy it, you strap it to a tree, and then when there's movement, it takes a picture. And this ranger, he tells us, well, we put up these cameras to monitor the movement of elephants and to see where poachers are active in the park. And then once every two or three months, we go to these cameras and we collect the memory card, we stick it in a computer, and then we can see, well, there was an elephant here four weeks ago and there was a poacher here five weeks ago. And that's when we thought, wait a minute, what if we can create a system that would send these, this, this information in real time to these rangers? So, elephant walks past, Ranger gets a WhatsApp. I think that would be really cool and it would really help these rangers better know what's, what's going on in the park and protect, uh, protect these animals. And, and the locals, of course. Uh, so that's what we set out to do. Um, one of the most important things for us always is how can we optimize our lines of code? So we didn't want to work on this for 10 years. We wanted to have something working, you know, within a very short period of time. And uh, one thing what I learned is that um, working with hardware is hard. So um, uh, that was a challenge for us. But we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So what we did is we opened up this thing and we re re reverse engineered it. And we just added some of our own hardware inside. And this extension allows it to communicate with this box. This, is, this, this contains some of our custom hardware that we built. Again, we um, mostly rely on reusing exist existing stuff. So this is based on open source hardware and there's a Raspberry Pi in here. It's a special Raspberry Pi without any of the connections. And a modem on top. So with this hardware, when there's now movement in front of this camera, it sends a message to this box. This box wakes up the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi uses a machine learning algorithm to classify what is on the image, if there's an elephant or a human or something else on the image. And then using a satellite modem, we send a message directly to the phone of a ranger. Like I said, hard, uh, working with hardware is hard, especially in these times with the global chip shortages. Uh, it seems like the Raspberry Pis are uh, becoming more extinct than these elephants. Uh, you can't find them anywhere. But um, um, yeah, we, uh, luckily we can just produce more when the time comes. So we created this system uh, and you know, this had to work in the most challenging conditions because there is no power in the jungle, there is no cell phone connectivity. That's why we chose to use a satellite uplink. Um, and this box, that's, uh, before I forget to mention it, uh, it's connected to a solar panel. So it recharges the batteries, and uh, most of the time the Raspberry Pi is turned off. And this way we created a system in under a year that did what we wanted to do, because we knew what kind of problem we wanted to solve. And that is why we were in the African jungle. We wanted to try it out and see if it works. So this was... This was what we were uh, working towards uh, for, for a year. So we hop back into that, into that 4x4 and we drive to a, low, a small village 
um, with, a, with a forest nearby where, uh, where there were elephants. And this village was, was suffering from human elephant conflicts before. So, you know, we were excited. We were finally going to test our hardware. So we, we, we come to this forest, and my colleague and I, we jump out of the car like a, a couple of excited teenagers, while uh, the ranger's like, shh. And he's, he, he listens. And I see him smell. And he tells us, that in this dense rainforest, there can be an elephant 10, 10 meters to your left, and you won't see it. But if you surprise it, then it will charge you like there is no rainforest. It will just run through it, and I will probably stumble upon the first twig that I encounter. So um, you, you can imagine, you know, normally the biggest risk I have is breaking a fingernail if I want to replace the batteries in my dreaded keyboard. And now this guy is telling me I could be charged and killed by an elephant. So for us, this was quite exciting to be there. We go deeper into the jungle. And the, this ranger is looking for an active elephant trail. It's amazing to see this guy work. He looks at the elephant poop and he can just say, oh, this is from, from two days ago and this is from, from yesterday. And he looks at the barks of the trees if there's mud on there because the elephants, they like to rub on, uh, onto it. Um, anyway, he finds an active elephant trail and we put up our cameras. Now this thing has to be pointed towards the, the path where the elephant is walking, obviously. And uh, this thing has to be high up in the tree. It has to be close enough to the camera to be able to make contact with it and download the images. But it has to be high enough to get some sun and to get the satellite message out. So we deploy our cameras, and uh, I wasn't sure if it's going to work, because it was kind of, you know, there were lots of leaves hanging over, and the satellite modem is quite sensitive. We had configured the system to send a WhatsApp message uh, to my colleague's phone. Uh, we put up two of these systems, and we leave. That night, I'm lying in my bed, and suddenly I wake up because, because I hear strange sounds. I, I hear a monkey in the distance, so I remember, oh yes, I'm in the African rainforest. But I also hear a phone going off through the tin wall beside me. And I think, could it be? The next morning I meet my colleague on the porch, and he confirms. Two of our cameras report to have seen an elephant. But since we're using the satellite modem, we don't actually see the image because it, that's way too much data to, to transmit. You, the, the modem that we use only allows you to send 300 bytes. So we have to go back to that camera to see what's on there and if our system worked. Now, we, we go back to our first camera. I open up the camera, take out the SD card, plug it into my computer, open up the first image, blank. Second image, blank. Third image, it's an animal. I don't know what kind of animal, but definitely not an elephant. So I was like, shit, this system doesn't work. Ah, that's, yeah. that's the eye. Yeah. That's the eye of the elephant. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's small, small one. What could it be that it's actually the elephants that are inside the fence now? Not only did our system work, but we actually got the same group of elephants on camera that broke into that plantation of these local women you had seen before. So for us, this was a huge moment. Now I want to go back to the machine learning part, just, just for a little bit. Because when I started working on this project, I had not done nothing with machine learning. And I don't know, I don't know about you, uh, have you ever trained a model? Can you raise hands, train the model? Okay, cool. 
Um, have any of you put a machine learning model into production? Less hands, okay. Cool. Uh, I had not, uh, done never nothing with machine learning, so I, I would just wanted first to find out how does it actually work and how can we use it to run on our hardware. Uh, I started my journey with um, this online course from FastAI. I don't know if you know it. It's from this guy, uh, uh, Jeremy Howard. Uh, so FastAI is uh, like an abstraction layer on top of PyTorch. And uh, he has a course. It's called Machine Learning for Developers or Deep Learning for de Software Developers. It's a really great course if you want to dive into it. Uh, and I learned, you know, baby steps, training a model, and I got, actually got very good results very soon. But then I needed to run my model on that Raspberry Pi. And what I found is that there are a lot of people, you know, busy training a model, but uh, there was a lot less information to be found on how do I actually run this model and how do I get it in pr into production, especially on a thing like a Raspberry Pi. So um, I had to look elsewhere because I tried to get FastAI running on the Raspberry Pi. I finally managed to do it, but I think it crashed half of the time and, uh, and it took like 25 seconds to inference a single image. Uh, so clearly that wasn't going to work for me. So I, I, I looked into TensorFlow. I think I think there are like two sides, right? TensorFlow and PyTorch. Is that is that? Well, maybe I'm I'm not an expert. Maybe I'm generalizing a bit too much. But I'm I went to look for te, uh, for TensorFlow because you have this thing TensorFlow Lite, and this is like a quantitized model that uh, is specially made to run on lightweight hardware like your phone or a Raspberry Pi. So. Um, yeah, I was kind of confident, you know, I got good results using FastAI, so I used a couple of uh, TensorFlow Lite examples to train an image classification model. Man, 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 I got shit results. It wasn't performing nearly as well as, the, as what I got from FastAI, but, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, so I, I didn't know how to fix it. Then I saw that there was this service called AutoML, and it's just this managed service from Google. You basically just upload your data set and you say, train, I want, an, I want to optimize for accuracy or for speed. I chose accuracy. And then after like 14 hours, it spits out the model uh, that I can run on the Raspberry Pi. Now, it kind of felt like cheating because, uh, you know, I was outwitted by a machine uh, in terms of training this thing. But I thought, well, what the heck? If it solves my problem, then that is good enough. Uh, so that is in a nutshell uh, what my uh, machine learning journey looked like. If you have any thoughts about this, then I'm, I'm happy to hear how we can improve on uh, you know, getting a better model for the next rollout we have planned. So we deployed our cameras. It worked. For us, this was a big validation that you know, we could hack together something, because it kind of feels like that, uh, that works, and could provide valuable intelligence for these rangers. Now, our time in Gabon was up. So we deployed in total 10 systems, and we would leave them there for a couple of months to gather more data. And what we have found is that these false positives that I saw the first for the, from the first camera that I opened, were the only ones. So for the rest uh, of the rollout, the system actually performed very good. So we hop back into the car and we drive the long journey back. Not something I was really looking forward to, but I, I needed to get back home. And while we were in the car, we got word that uh, the head of anti poaching and the Minister of the Environment and the Forest of Gabon uh, got wind of what we were doing there, and they invited us over to uh, get introduced and have a chat. So when we got back, we were in this, in this room with this minister and the head of Ansa Poaching. And it's, it's like this big guy, tattoos, 
uh, and he's telling stories about his adventures in the jungle and he's, he's sharing with us how poachers work and where they enter the country. He's actually, he walks to his desk and he shows us the bullets that he got shot at by these poachers. Because, because you have to think there are a lot of different types of poachers. You have you know, just locals that are hunting for beef, bush meat to provide for their families. But you also have like the, these paramilitary groups that are using AK-47s and they, they hunt in packs. So he was showing the, uh, us these, these bullets and we were, we were like, okay, this is the perfect timing because we had one more trick up our sleeves. We knew a thing or two about poaching because previously when we talked to rangers, you know, they told us how do you, they work with the cameras, but they also shared with us that if they catch a poacher, that it always has two things with it. Be a weapon, and can you guess what the other thing is? A phone. Yes. And he needs this phone because he uses it for, nav for navigation or just playing Candy Crush because it's just, you know, he's, he's out there for days sometimes. Uh, but also to call his buddies because if you have poached an elephant and you have all this stuff with you, then, you know, you need to uh, be extracted with a vehicle. And that's when we thought, well, that's interesting. What if we could build a sensor that could sense the presence of mobile phones in these, in these forests? And that is exactly what we did. And we brought one of the prototypes with us to Gabon when we went there for testing. So I got the sensor from my bag and I showed it uh, to the head of Antipoach and I explained what it did. It basically detects all the signals that your phone transmits. So it can detect the pre human presence in places where there shouldn't be any humans. And at the end of the meeting, um, this is what uh, the minister says to us. You know, it sounds dramatic to say it's a matter of life and death for the Echo Guards, but fewer of our Echo Guards will die um, and more poachers will be caught if we can deploy this technology. Now, we didn't take this quote very lightly. Now, this guy has been working in conservation his whole life. He has been a scientist himself, working at the same research station as, as, uh, as where we uh, stayed. And he is now Minister of Gabon, in charge of protecting the flora and fauna there. So this gave us the confidence to continue, and we were now scaling up our efforts, inventing new uh, stuff to help rangers protect this wildlife. And this year we plan to uh, roll out these GSM sensors into two locations in Africa. Now I think that we as software developers have an important job. You know, everywhere, in every, in every industry, software is revolutionizing uh, the world, basically. And this can be for better or for worse, especially in machine learning. So your code, it matters. There's this uh, documentary on Netflix. Um, what is it called again? It's uh, oh, The Social Dilemma. And this perfectly explains what happens if you optimize for the wrong thing. If you haven't watched it, then definitely go and watch it. But it shows that if you optimize mach with a machine learning model for the wrong thing, which is usually profit, or user attention, then in the end it can spark civil wars. And I think, now imagine what can happen if we would all optimize for impact, not just with machine learning, but, but also with your own skill set. Now I would have never imagined that I would be in the African jungle, you know, because of my programming skills. But I think it's not so much the specific skills, but much more to find the courage um, that really matters. You know, dig deep down into yourself and find the guts to just go out and try these kind of things. 
And you will learn the, the skills needed along the way. So I just want to leave you with this. What do you really care about? And what, what's the thing that you want to go after? And why don't you just give it a shot? You might be surprised where it will take you. Thank you.